Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is solstice. And to uh, enlighten us on this topic is Tim Campbell. Tim, welcome to the program. Hey, Don. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome, as always. So, with a word like solstice, what is a solstice? So, the word solstice translates literally to mean sun stops. And so that's the easy explanation. Uh, but with that answer, that probably leads to more questions. It would, yes. <laughs> so to think about what do they mean by the sun stops? You know, what does the earth stop spinning around? What's going on here? Um, it's, it's not that. It's that ask yourself a different question, which is, where does the sun rise? And most people would say the sun rises. In the east, of course. In the east, yeah. And vaguely it does, but not precisely. It turns out that every day of the year, the sun rises in a different position along the eastern horizon line. And so in the summer months, it actually rises north of east. Um, and in the winter months, it rises south of east. And the only day that it actually rises in the east, well, twice a year, are on the equinoxes, the spring and, and uh, autumn equinoxes. It rises precisely in the east. But all the other days, it rises someplace else. And so uh, ancients noticed that each day the sun seems to be progressing farther and farther north. And until one day the sun stops progressing to the north, and that's the day they call the solstice, the sun stops. Uh, that day is officially the first day of summer. That's why we declare it to be summer is because we had the summer solstice and the sun has stopped progressing to the north. Okay, well then what happens next? So to, to ask yourself, well, why, why does this happen? Um, let me, maybe if I could just share a little animation for you. Um, go into my settings real quick and I'll just share my monitor and I've got an animation for you and these are the seasons of the earth and so the earth is actually tilted on its axis at about 23 and a half degrees uh, going around the sun and actually let me just speed up this animation I need this to go a little bit faster than one hour Let's see if I can get it to go by uh, days one, come on, let's go to sidereal days and play that. There we go. Okay, now you can see that the Earth is uh, going around the sun. Now we have an exaggerated and large Earth, but no really those polar axis going through the sun, blue on top, yellow on the bottom. That actually points in the same direction all year round. So the sun, or the Earth does not wobble around oscillating like a top, actually it does, but it takes 26,000 years to do it just once, roughly. So, um, so what's going on here is this means that when the Earth is, you know, sort of on this left side of the frame, uh, the northern polar axis is tipped away from the sun, but when it's on the east side of the frame, or the right, the right side of your monitor, um, it, the northern polar axis is tilted toward the sun. And this has an interesting little effect. If I stop this and go to another animation for you, uh, let's pull up this one. And so here you can see the Earth again, uh, and I'm going to superimpose this with some, some lines. And so in the middle, I have the equator. I have the Tropic of Cancer in the north, Capricorn in the south. Those tropics are the tilts of the sun, 23 and a half degrees. Uh, or sorry, tilt of the Earth, 23 and a half degrees. And I also have the Arctic and Antarctic circle. And then watch what happens here um, when I animate this. Uh, when the Earth appears to be tilting away, uh, this is the northern hemisphere winter uh, in the south, uh, southern hemisphere. They're having summer. Um, what happens is this spot that used to be on the equator is now directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. And notice that the Arctic Circle is completely in darkness. The sun never rises there, but the Antarctic Circle is completely in sunlight. The sun never sets there. Now, six months later, we can tilt this back the other way. And the opposite thing happens. So now the uh, sun appears to be directly above the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere. The Arctic Circle is completely in sunlight and the Antarctic Circle is completely in darkness. And so that tilt causes the sun to appear to rise. If you were on the, so this, this uh, day actually here, the way I've got this diagram, this would actually be um, the summer solstice. And so on this day, you could imagine if you lived on the equator, 
this would be uh, the sun rising 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. Now, that doesn't actually happen uh, to us, and I can show you yet another animation. So uh, if I go to, uh, so here, this is uh, Quito, Ecuador. I picked Quito, Ecuador uh, because it's roughly on the equator. It's less than a degree uh, off of the equator. So for, for practical purposes, it's on the equator. And this is set up for sunrise. And you can see I've got the camera uh, pointing to the east here. This is a simulation software. This isn't real. Uh, and I'll go ahead and start it. And there I have the sunrise over here. And if I highlight the sun, um, I'm reading off the azimuth um, uh, position. And this is uh, actually, I'm on the wrong, am I on the wrong day? Why am I getting an azimuth of, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the azimuth of 66 and a half degrees. So 66 and a half degrees plus uh, 23 and a half degrees, and you get 90 degrees. Uh, and so that's 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. So that's what you get for Quito, Ecuador. Now, if I change that to um, Detroit and do this again, uh, something interesting happens. The sun starts to come up. But notice that, first of all, it's coming up on a much stronger angle. Um, and second of all, it's much farther left. It's, it's farther north. And if I put my mouse over there, now it's at 57 degrees, roughly. So about uh, 33 degrees north of the equator. So wh why does this happen? So if I grab, and I don't know how well this will read for the camera here, but if I grab my globe here, um, and I'll use this as a pointer uh, as the direction of the sun, you can see that that's roughly uh, 23 and a half degree angle. The farther north I go though, up to Michigan, the angle gets stronger. And if I give you a, a different perspective, remember I said that this part in the Arctic Circle is entirely in sunlight. Uh, the sun never sets uh, for a lot of the year here. So imagine that you are on, imagine that, the, that you are the, the direction of the sun uh, and that you are at a point of light just, or your point on the earth that's just beyond the Arctic Circle. Um, the sun will appear to be above the horizon for almost the entire day, just barely dip below the horizon and dip right up again. And where you would be when that dip below the horizon and dip right up again would be practically due north. Um, so the farther north you go, the more northern the sun appears to rise. Um, and so uh, that's why you don't get just a simple 23 and a half degrees north of due east. Um, it changes depending on where you are uh, on the planet. So Tim, there's this uh, funny little figure eight gizmo that you usually see plopped in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what's up with that? Yeah, so, so that is an interesting thing. I first saw one of these things, I was a young boy and it was in my uh, school's uh, library. They had a, you know, of course it's a library, so they have a really large globe and I see this figure eight thing and I notice that there's dates um, on it. And so this thing is actually called the sun analemma. And the up-downness of this figure eight stripe, that kind of makes sense. Um, these markings that you see on the analemma indicate the latitude of where the sun will appear to be directly over the Earth um, on those particular dates. Uh, but the east-westness of it, you know, why is it twisted into a figure eight, uh, that's a little bit more mysterious. And so uh, for that, I can show you a quick animation here. Let me just make this full screen. And here's an animation, and let me just start this running. And you can see, actually, I'm going to slow this down so it doesn't go so fast. And you can see the sun uh, zipping up and down and up and down in the sky. Um, this is the effect of what would happen if you set up a, say, a camera on a tripod, uh, pointed it. Uh, to the sky, say at midday or at some time of day, you need to take the photograph at exactly the same, same time. And you do this for an entire year. And if you do this for an entire year, uh, the sun will uh, appear to be in one of these positions. And if you, compo you composited all those images together, you get this big, brightly lit figure eight. And so here I have this animation just sort of tracing it out. Um, what is actually going on, though, is uh, so the, the north-southness is, is caused by the tilt of the Earth. The east-westness is actually caused by a different phenomenon, and I have a diagram that can kind of show that to you. If I flip over to here, 
Oh, uh, by the way, this image was taken by a gentleman, um, Jack Fishburne. Uh, he, he, this is a photographer who actually took this uh, image. Uh, he didn't take this image every single day. Uh, he waited several days between the images, so you get the, but you see the roughly the, the traced out shape there. Um, of course, it does need to be clear, so uh, you can't take it on cloudy days. Um, and uh, you might have to wait, you know, if you do get a lot of cloudy days, maybe some rotten luck, you might have to, you know, wait until the next year and take the picture on the same day to get that. Um, but here's what's going on. I've got a, a super exaggerated image here. So I've got the earth and the sun, and notice I have an arrow pointing exactly toward the sun. The earth is of course spinning around, but as it's spinning around, the earth is moving forward in space. And so we think of a day as just being 24 hours. It, it turns out it's a little more complicated than that. So it takes the earth, um, you know, how long does it take the earth to do one complete 360 degree rotation on its axis? It turns out it's not actually 24 hours because we move forward as we're doing this. And when we do this, the amount of time involved is about 23 hours, 56 minutes, and four seconds. In fact, it's actually known to a much greater precision than that, um, but roughly. But now you can see this arrow is actually missing the sun. It used to be pointing to the sun. Now it's not because we've moved forward. Again, I've exaggerated this. The sun would not move that far forward in just one day, uh, but it makes the effect easy to see. So now the Earth has to completely spin for another several minutes, almost four minutes, uh, to get to the point where it's actually pointed at the sun again. And so now the sun has appeared to return to the same position in the sky, maybe you know noon on the middle of the day. And that's what we think of as 24 hours, except even that isn't 24 hours. And here's the problem. I have, once again, a really exaggerated uh, view of what's going on with the solar system. We think of our orbit around the sun as being a circle. Turns out it's not a circle. It's slightly elliptical. Now, I've really exaggerated the ellipse in this diagram. It turns out if you could sort of hover at some point in space and watch the Earth and then you traced out a path, it would be almost a perfect circle. It's only slightly elliptical. Uh, but the distance uh, is, you know, this 93 million mile roughly distance. That varies by a little tiny bit. And so for part of the year, we get a little bit closer to the sun. And because we're getting a little bit closer to the sun, so imagine we're here and we're coming toward the sun. As we're getting closer and closer, we're speeding up. Think of it like, you know, if you throw a ball in the air, as it's going up in the air, it's slowing down, but as it's coming back down toward the ground, it's speeding up again. So we're speeding up as we get closer to the sun, about a little over 30, almost 30 and a half kilometers a second is our velocity heading through space. When we get beyond the sun, we start to slow down. And when we get to the farthest, most distant point, uh, about July 3rd, um, we are actually only going about 29 and a half kilometers a second. Um, so our speed is actually varying. So what, but now the rotational speed of the planet, that's pretty much the same, but the velocity through space that we're getting, that's actually varying just a little tiny bit. And that means that if you sat there with a stopwatch and you you know, find the center line in the sky, what we call the central meridian point, where the sun is directly overhead between the eastern and western half of the sky, and you sat there with a stopwatch, and you waited it out, you would discover that the amount of time that it took the sun to go from that center point in the sky one day to that center point in the sky the next day is not actually exactly 24 hours. It'll start to grow a little bit, be a little bit longer, or it'll start to uh, speed up and, and shrink a little bit and be a little less than 24 hours. And that is what causes uh, that figure eight effect that we call the sun analemma, uh, is the fact that the Earth is moving forward and it takes a little more rotation because we're going a little bit faster. So it takes a little more rotation before the sun returns to the, the center point in the sky or the Earth is slowing down and it doesn't have to rotate as much before the sun returns to the center point in the sky. And so because our um, day when we are closest to the sun versus the day when we are farthest to the sun, are not actually aligned to the tilt of the Earth when we are tilted most, most toward the sun or most away from the sun, uh, because those days don't align, you get this figure eight twisting that happens. It's different on different planets. If it were aligned, uh, you would get something that was would be more like an oval or an ellipse. Interesting. I'm sure a, a number of our visitors have uh, seen that and wondered what what was up with that, or even if they remember from the movie Lost with Tom Hanks 
in his little cave how he marked the analemma to, uh, so he would know the passage of time. Yeah, so the, um, so it turns out the fascinating thing is that, uh, you know, we kind of have this simplified view of it, but when you really get into the nitty gritty, the nuances are just slightly more complicated and it creates these really interesting effects. Uh, we have our, our ballpark numbers that we use to live our lives every day, but uh, you kind of drilled down uh, a little bit deeper to help uh, explain the concepts. It's, uh, it's a fascinating look. So we've, we've got the solstice, we've got the analemma. Anything else you got there, Tim? Well, no, you did want to talk about the uh, um, uh, um, archaeoastronomy topic. And I uh, thought you that's might right. want to do that after the break. All right. Well, that's a great place to uh, take a break at this point. Uh, we uh, would like to see an email from you. Um, the email address is always down at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next with Term of the Month, is Stephen. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. The European Space Agency and NASA mission SOHO was launched in December 1995. It sits in a Sun-Earth L1 halo orbit and so stays about a million miles from Earth with a clear view of the Sun. The planned mission was for two years. There was a nail-biting near-loss event from June 24, 1998 until February 1, 1999. During it, all of the gyros failed, including the last one. ESA developed a new gyroless operation mode more than 25 years since launch and SOHO is still in service. Six instruments are designed to investigate three parts of the solar atmosphere, including the chromosphere, the transition region, and the corona. Two instruments are used to investigate the solar wind near the spacecraft. The interior of the sun is probed with three instruments for helioseismology. SOHO doesn't exactly sit at L1, and for two reasons. First, L1 is not a stable location. Second, since L1 is directly between the Earth and the sun, solar radio interference would make communications difficult. Instead, it orbits around L1 in a six-month ellipse. Here are two views of a halo coronal mass ejection coming straight at Earth in 2015. SOHO sends a continuous 200 kilobits per second data stream to Earth via NASA's Deep Space Network. Data about solar activity are used to predict coronal mass ejection arrival times to Earth to protect satellites and electrical grids. SOHO captured this sun grazing comet as it dived toward the sun in 2011. SOLO has discovered over 4,000 comets, approximately half of all of those known. The LASCO instrument blocks the sun's glare, and you get an image. Over 70 people from 18 countries have searched for comets in publicly available SOHO, SOHO images online. And that is SOHO, the term of the month. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. Our topic for this month's show is solstice, and our guest is Tim Campbell. Now, Tim, I understand there are a number of ancient sites that people would use to help them keep track of the passing of the day and the year. Can you tell yeah, us about Yeah, so they call this uh, field archaeoastronomy. It's just basically a blend of archaeology and astronomy. And it could be a site. Sometimes it's an artifact. You talked about the Antikythera, it's of course an artifact. Probably the most popular one of these things is Stonehenge. Everybody's heard of that. Um, I've got a diagram for you uh, of what it may have looked like in the past. Uh, it doesn't look like that today. You can see the ring. Uh, that's uh, very famous. Off to the right, you see some stones. I've got this shaft of light coming through. The farthest away point is called the heel stone. There's a, two side-to-side -side stones a little bit closer, and they call those the slaughter stone. 
Uh, if you stand in the uh, center on the day of the solstice, the sun, and look between the slaughter stones at the hill stone in the distance, the sun will appear to rise exactly at that point off in the distance. Also, if you flip it around uh, six months later on the winter solstice, if you were standing outside beyond the hill stone looking back towards Stonehenge, the sun would appear to set in the center of the ring. Um, so that's the, the Stonehenge site. Uh, very quickly, Fahada Butte is another one. Uh, this was uh, a site, there was uh, uh, a volunteer artist uh, recording the petroglyphs uh, on the rock faces and stumbled onto what appeared to be some uh, slabs of, of, of rock, didn't look, you know, could have been just, you know, fallen there, quite frankly, except that behind it, this petroglyph of uh, concentric rings was found on the wall. The interesting part happens when it is noticed that the shafts of light come through the cracks in the rocks because of the way the slabs were placed. And on the day of the winter solstice, the sunlights project just at the edge, framing uh, that uh, circular bullseye looking petroglyph. And on the summer solstice, uh, exactly in the center, because of course that light projection moves with the sun's migration. Uh, so uh, it almost looked like an accident, but clearly that was done deliberately. Uh, another one is Abu Simbel. Now, this one's a little bit different because it's not aligned to solstices or equinoxes. This one aligns to February 22nd, which is about two months after the winter solstice, and October 22nd, about two months before the winter solstice. Abu Simbel, the temple of Ramses the Great. Um, and the interesting bit about this is uh, there is that hallway that you see in the larger image. Uh, there's a, a doorway that goes into a hallway with a shaft that goes uh, deep inside the temple. And there's a chamber at the back. And in the back of the chamber are these carved uh, statues of gods. And the gods in these are uh, Ra and Amun in the center, Ramses on the right. Uh, and the god Ta, Ta is the god, and I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly, the god of the underworld, I'm sorry, the god of darkness, rather. Um, and so the light doesn't ever shine on the God of Darkness, Ta. Uh, again, not a chance alignment. So cleverly done, not aligned to solstices. Um, there is one last one that I love to throw in only because it's local. Henry and Clara Ford built their estate Fairlane uh, on the banks of the Rouge River. Uh, this uh, complex that you see in the upper right part of the frame, that's actually the uh, University of Michigan Dearborn campus there on Evergreen Road, uh, and their estate is behind it. Now. There is this uh, sort of dark orange line going toward the northwest. This used to be a forest. They had trees cut down and a meadow put in. Um, and it looks like it could be a random angle, but it turns out uh, that was deliberate. That angle, uh, the sun is at 303 and a half degrees. Um, and it turns out on the day of the summer solstice, this isn't the sunrise, this ends up being the sunset. So they can sit on their patio or their terrace uh, and enjoy the sunset exactly between the tree line uh, in the middle of their meadow uh, because they had it aligned exactly to that angle. So kind of a fun local fact. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, Tim, I want to thank you for bringing us this information that uh, can hopefully help our viewers uh, get a little bit better understanding of the solstice. Uh, We'd like to have you check our club website. Uh, the address is down at the bottom of your screen. And to finish up the show, as always, is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. What's Up in the Night Sky for June 2021? June is the month of the summer solstice. Typically, it's on the 21st, but here in Detroit, it takes place on the 20th of June 28 minutes before midnight. That's kind of like the 21st for most of us. And the moment of the summer solstice or the winter solstice in the Southern Hemisphere isn't that important. Uh, the longest day uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the shortest day in the Southern Hemisphere is roughly speaking the 21st or thereabouts. The start of the new season, certainly. June has the last quarter as the first phase on the second. The new moon is on the 10th, where the skies are going to be darkest for the most part. The first quarter moon is on the 17th. Remember, the first quarter is mostly an evening phenomenon. It 
and the moon sets, so your uh, after midnight-ish uh, mornings are uh, moon-free. And then finally, the full moon, which is up all night, is on the 24th of June. Mars and Venus are shown here on the 15th and, uh, and in the evening. Uh, Mercury is in Taurus and has inferior conjunction on the 10th of June. So this is not a great month for Mercury. Your best bet for Mercury would be to try to spot it um, down and to the right of Venus in the trees on the 30th of June, if you want to see it on, uh, in a, on a June day. Uh, but as I said, not a great month for Mercury. Venus is in Taurus and goes to Cancer. Mars is in Gemini and also goes to Cancer. These are both uh, up for a couple of hours after sunset all month. Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto are shown here on the 30th of the month, about two hours before sunrise. Now, at the beginning of the month, this entire lineup is visible, but it's visible starting four hours before sunrise if you wanted to catch them all. Uh, Pluto, I'm going to start with Pluto uh, because it actually rises first. Pluto is in Sagittarius. It is nearing opposition. That happens on July 17th. Um, we're getting to the best time to spot Pluto. Pluto is not easy to spot. You, uh, I've seen it in a, in a 10 inch, but it's getting farther from the sun than when I saw it. Uh, so you might need a 12 inch or a larger telescope. Uh, and you'll need an extremely good uh, sky chart. It's really just a dot in a 10 inch, I'm very faint at that. Uh, Saturn is in Capricornus. Uh, Jupiter is in Aquarius, as is Neptune. And Uranus is in Aries. Now note, uh, near Uranus, although this is not a great landmark, uh, we have the dwarf planet Ceres, and you could check out Ceres. Uh, one Ceres, or, you know, the first asteroid that was found, is now a dwarf planet. Uh, and then near where Neptune is, uh, you can also uh, look for Pallas. This is two Pallas, the second of the asteroids that was found, and it's not a real surprise that the largest of the asteroids were found first. And that is what's up in the night sky for June 2021. Remember, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain.